morning and welcome to Psychiatry Grand Rounds. This morning I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Diana Moreland. Dr. Moreland completed her um, uh, excuse me, her uh, Bachelor's of Arts in Psychology at the College of William and Mary. She has a Master's of Science in Clinical Psychology from the University of Georgia and a PhD in Clinical Psychology from the University of Georgia. She completed her internship in Clinical Psychology at Virginia Commonwealth University Medical Center and a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Michigan. She is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at East Tennessee State University. Please welcome Dr. Moreland. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here to speak with you about Mom Power, which is a parenting intervention um, that incorporates trauma-informed curriculum to reach mothers who are at risk for a variety of reasons. And I'll talk to you about that as we go. Before I even start talking about the intervention, I like to um, have a parallel process to give you the experience of what it's like to be a part of the intervention. And in the intervention, we use the tree as a metaphor for how to build a healthy attachment relationship between a caregiver and a child. Um, and we talk a lot about how important it is to put down strong roots so that we can grow big and strong. And we use that for caregivers and children, but it's really true for all of us. We need strong roots. And so I wanna take a moment to express gratitude um, for all of the mentors along the way that have helped build my roots, and most recently that being at my postdoc fellowship at the University of Michigan with Kate Rosenblum and Maria Music, who are experts in infant mental health. Dr. Music is a perinatal psychiatrist. Dr. Rosenblum is a clinical psychologist with expertise in infant mental health. And Mom Power was the development um, that came out of a collaboration between those two and then a social worker, Melissa Schuster, who really saw a need. They were working with a lot of mothers with trauma histories, mental health difficulties around pregnancy and postpartum, um, and then following these mothers over time and seeing how it impacts the children um, of the mothers who are struggling for a variety of reasons. And so they decided to create Mom Power, um, and they decided to share that with me and allow me to bring it down here to Northeast Tennessee. So I just wanted to acknowledge those roots that have allowed me to branch out and come down here and share this with you all. So motherhood, um, and I'll speak to motherhood. I want to acknowledge that fathers matter and all caregivers matter, but it's mom power, so I'm going to speak mostly about moms right now. Um, motherhood in and of itself is a, is a risky time. Pregnancy um, is a time of vulnerability given all the hormonal changes, the physiological changes, the social and emotional changes that happen during pregnancy and postpartum. With the best of circumstances, it's a time of vulnerability. And then you add other contexts of risk and it becomes a lot more vulnerable. So first, just want to acknowledge perinatal depression. Perinatal meaning surrounding pregnancy, pregnancy and postpartum. About one in four moms will experience some perinatal depression symptoms across that time. And about 15% of mothers, um, or one to two out of 10, will experience clinically significant depression during the perinatal period. So it's a relatively common problem. It's under talked about. There's a lot of stigma around it. Um, and so the majority of these mothers experiencing these symptoms are not getting the treatment that they might need. Trauma, unfortunately, is also relatively common for women. So one in two women report experiencing some kind of sexual, sexual victimization across their lifespan. And that's any unwanted sexual experience that they've had. And then one in four women are survivors of interpersonal violence. So this would be things such as sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse. Within pregnancy, um, um, a survey at the University of Michigan um, kind of surveyed several hundred women who were getting prenatal care and found that about a third of those women reported some form of childhood maltreatment. Those of you becoming familiar with the ACEs or adverse childhood experiences, childhood maltreatment is just another way of saying ACEs. It's one of those, or actually several of those ACEs. Um, so one in three were reporting that they had some, some sort of childhood maltreatment. Um, and then about four to eight percent of women surveyed were reporting that they were actively in um, a situation where there was intimate partner violence. So somebody um, aggressing violence against them during the pregnancy period. About 5% of these women reported perinatal um, clinically significant PTSD symptoms during pregnancy or postpartum. So just recognizing that that's creating a greater context of risk around pregnancy. Um, and then add sociodemographic risk. So all of the factors that we know put families at risk, so low income, low education, single motherhood, teen motherhood, those sorts of factors just exacerbate everything that I've already talked. It heightens the 
likelihood that folks are exposed to maltreatment and it also heightens the likelihood that folks are experiencing depression symptoms. And it makes sense to me if you think about it, the greater the stress in your environment during an already stressful time of pregnancy and postpartum, the more likely you are to have some mental health difficulties. I want to take a moment and connect this with the ACEs stuff that's becoming bigger and bigger in the state. For um, those of you who do um, kind of child development work, um, I think it's no surprise that what happens to us during our childhood impacts our health, both physical and mental, across the lifespan. Um, but the ACEs has done a really nice job of getting that message out there across sectors and creating a common language that we use to talk about this. So ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. Um, and there's different categories. So first we have abuse. Um, and in there we have physical abuse. We have emotional abuse. So this would be um, also called psychological maltreatment. And that's things like chronic um, harsh messages to children telling them that they're unlovable, that they're bad, um, that they're stupid. It's not just one time telling a child to be quiet or, or uh, not giving a child what they want. It's really chronic and ongoing, and it conveys the message that the child is unloved or that there's something wrong with the child. And if you think about development, childhood is a time when children are developing a sense of self and a sense of self-worth and a sense of who they are in relationships and in the world. So if they're hearing those messages over and over again, it's really detrimental to their development. Um, and then there's also sexual abuse that falls in that category. Neglect. Neglect is the most common category that we're likely to see for our under three population. Um, and some folks think that neglect isn't as bad as abuse just because abuse you see bruises and neglect you don't. But neglect is just as bad, if not worse, for children developing brains um, and developing sense of self. Um, so you've got physical neglect. These are parents who aren't able to meet their child's physical needs, maybe a safe, a safe house, consistent food, safe supervision. And then there's emotional neglect, so failing to meet children's emotional needs. Um, during a time when children are developing all the systems around emotion regulation, understanding what I feel and how to regulate it and how to calm down. So emotional neglect is also really detrimental. And then there's five categories of household dysfunction. Living with a caregiver with mental illness, um, experiencing uh, being in a domestic violence situation or an intimate partner violence situation where parents are ex or children are exposed to violence is really detrimental. Divorce, and it's not just being in a home where there's divorce, but it's being in a home where there's divorce and there's a loss of a primary attachment person. So there's a divorce and then somebody goes away and I lose my primary attachment figure. A family member going to prison or being incarcerated and then living with somebody with substance abuse. The higher the ACE is, the greater the risk. So this is just one illustration of the pathway of how these early childhood experiences then put children at risk for disrupted neurodevelopment during a time at which their brains are so sensitive, so much is happening um, during those first three years. Um, and then that leads to social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. So really across all the domains of functioning, we know the greater the ACEs, the greater the risk across domains. And then it's really like a snowball effect. Those children are then um, at greater risk for health, um, kind of risky behaviors and maladaptive health behaviors. So you see substance abuse starting earlier. You see maybe risky sexual behavior starting earlier. Um, you see children who are abused are at a greater risk of being in an intimate partner violent situation as adults. So being in relationships that are unhealthy and risky. So a lot of snowballing effect of how this risk accumulates over time. Um, and then you see kind of greater risk for disease, social problems, um, and early death is a, a final risk. The higher the ACE is, the shorter the lifespan. Putting this in the context of parenting in early childhood, you think of a mom who has a lot of ACEs. Then we know this mom is at greater risk for mental health problems such as depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and substance use and abuse. We know this mom is at greater risk to be in a domestic violence situation, have health problems, perhaps be at risk for being in a poverty situation, and being more socially isolated. Then these factors, this mother has a child, and this child is born into a home where they're already at risk for ACEs, just by the very nature of the fact that mom had ACEs, mom is having these risk factors, child is born, there's already ACEs present. Mom has depression, there's one ACE. Mom is abusing substances, there's two ACEs. And so you have a child that then develops similar problems, and then that child goes on to have a child when they're an adult, and on and on we go. So in other words, when children are exposed to poor parenting and or abuse, recognizing that poor parenting is not abuse, it's really on a continuum, um, and wanting to be clear about that. Um, but even poor parenting can put children 
on this pathway um, toward maladaptation. Then they grow up to become adults and become parents whose children are exposed to poor parenting or abuse. Um, we do what we've had done to us. Um, we learn through seeing and through experiencing. And so if our earlier experiences um, were of a lot of chaotic things, of unhealthy relationships, of unhealthy behaviors, um, then we're more likely to, to go on and do that as adults and pass that through generation and generation. And this is illustrating what's called the intergenerational transmission of risk from caregiver to child across generations. So how do we stop this cycle with effective interventions? And there's a lot of folks out there working on this. There's a lot of really great interventions. And I'm going to speak to mom power as one tool in our tool belt as we're trying to break this intergenerational transmission of risk. Um, those of you doing intervention work know you can have a great intervention um, and still not get it out there because there are barriers. Things get in the way. You can offer something, but there's a lot of things that can keep people from accessing it. And so one of the studies at the University of Michigan that was surveying these, these mothers during pregnancy and postpartum, and specifically surveying mothers with trauma histories, asked them what gets in the way of you not being able to get the services that you need during this time. One of those is no childcare. As a mother, if I've got depression, I can't make it to individual therapy if there's nobody to watch the children. So recognizing that childcare is a huge barrier. The mom power model tries to reduce this barrier through offering childcare. Um, so we have a, a mother's group, it's a parenting group, but we have a parallel child group. We call it child team. And in its best form, we have one-to-one -one child care. Um, provided, and it's meant to be trauma-informed, developmentally sensitive, culturally competent child care. So really training our child team to help create a safe space for these mothers to leave their children so that they can attend the parenting group. Um, and during that child team, we have weekly activities, games, toys, etc. Lack of resources. So we're targeting mothers at risk, um, and finances can be a big um, barrier for them being able to access services, transportation, etc. So the mom power model tries to build in incentives to recognize that these mothers um, likely need help with things like toys and diapers um, and food. We try to help with transportation when possible through coordinating um, cab services or giving bus vouchers or giving gas cards um, and also referring to other services that exist in the community that are meant to support families um, who are in need with various things. If I'm a mother and I have a trauma history and, and I've been in a, a family that's been kind of surrounded by chaos and mental health problems for generations, I may have learned to not trust the system. I may have a lot of shame about the past abuse that I've experienced or the current abuse that I'm experiencing. Um, and I might be afraid that Child Protective Services will be involved if I go to a parenting class because I've seen it happen before with my other kids or maybe it happened to me when I was young, and so I just don't quite trust the system. I'm afraid if I ask for help, somebody will take my child away. And so to help recognize that and reduce that barrier, Mom Power, in its um, manualized therapeutic milieu, really works to build a safe, non-judgmental, welcoming environment for these caregivers, um, and uses a metaphor of balancing being strong and in charge, so creating a safe space where I can, as the leader, say, I'm gonna keep you safe, I'm in charge, but also warm and welcoming. And this parallels what we're asking caregivers to do for their child, that balanced parenting that we want to see. Recognizing that mental health symptoms in and of themselves are a barrier to reaching out for help. When I'm stressed, I don't think I have time for anything else. When I'm anxious, I want to avoid. If I'm socially anxious, I definitely don't want to go to a group. If I'm depressed, I want to withdraw. I might have low motivation. I might have low hope. These things in and of themselves hold people back from accessing the services that might be helpful. So, Mom Power incorporates self-care skills, teaching moms how to take care of themselves before asking them to take care of their child. It also pulls from a lot of our evidence-based psychotherapy interventions, such as cognitive behavior therapy and dialectical behavior therapy um, and infant mental health, to pull in um, techniques that we know are effective at treating symptoms such as anxiety, depression, and stress. Recognizing that poor social support, I feel alone, I'm not sure if I can ask for help, I'm, I feel like I don't have anyone to support me in caregiving can be a big barrier. And so Mom Power is a group. It's a group intentionally to be able to give these mothers the experience of connecting with other mothers of similarly aged children to um, not feel so alone. We also all start out with a family meal when families arrive. So we sit down and we eat together so that we all feel welcomed and connected. It's a chance to talk. For some of these mothers, it's some of the only interaction they have with other adults during the week. 
depending on their situation. And then in week eight out of 10, we have guest week where we invite the mothers to invite somebody who supports them in parenting. This might be a co-parent, this might be a parent, it might be a grandparent, it might be somebody from church, it might be somebody from their neighborhood. Um, and we really welcome um, that person and that week it's toward the end so the mothers have learned the curriculum and they get to teach it. So it's one way to empower the mothers that they show them what they've learned and allow them to share it with somebody that matters to them. That's also a way to get buy-in from somebody who's important in the mother's life and to support the mother so that when she graduates mom power, somebody else has heard the language and heard the metaphors and can support her. Recognizing that a trauma history can be a barrier um, for a lot of the reasons we've talked about, but also just that anxiety of I don't feel safe um, and therefore I won't approach this unknown situation. And so the, the curriculum itself is trauma focused. We incorporate what we know about how trauma impacts our ability to learn and our, our ability to engage and we really kind of thoughtfully and sensitively address that throughout the course, as well as in the entire structure of the group. So I've been speaking with a lot of mothers getting ready for our first group, and even from the very first phone call, the way that we speak to mothers is trauma-informed. It's empathic, it's understanding, um, it's not making any assumptions, um, it's kind of being curious about their experience and kind of that question of, of what's happened to you rather than what's wrong with you. Um, and empowering moms to feel like they have a, a say and a decision in their own care and their own treatment through giving them information and empowering them to decide what's right for them. So one example of, of being trauma informed is we have the child team and the mom team, but we never force a mom to put her child in the child team. We have a lot of moms who were abused as kids and maybe their children have been abused and they don't trust strangers with their child and we don't blame them and so if we have a mother that says I want my child with me I don't feel comfortable leaving them with the child team we say absolutely no problem how can we support you so that's just one example of how we incorporate that um, and then mistrust we try to address through all of the things that I've mentioned as well as through from the very moment they get there establishing confidentiality um, letting the group itself create the guidelines of what they need to feel safe um, and creating that non-judgmental environment for these mothers. We never tell them they're doing something wrong. We never tell them to stop doing something um, unless we're really worried about child safety, but that rarely happens in these groups. Really, it's a non-directive, non-judgmental um, therapeutic environment for these women. They've had enough providers telling them that what they're doing is wrong. They don't need that from us. Um, and it's, it's not consistent with creating a safe and non-judgmental environment for them. <clears throat> So the goals of Mom Power are to briefly engage, um, briefly intervene to engage moms. So get them in the door. Get them in the door and, and give them an experience with um, kind of mental health, but we don't pose it as mental health, so I'd say kind of more holistic health um, of parenting, around a parenting class, um, and then refer them to additional services. So this is not meant to be the last um, intervention that a family will receive. It's really meant to be the first and to help open the door, get them in the door, and show them that they can have their needs met by the system and by these types of providers, and they can learn about parenting in a safe and supported way. For the moms participating in Mom Power, we hope that they'll be able to engage in treatment and come. Um, we hope that they'll learn some ways to cope with their stress and some strategies for parenting with both kindness and strength. So again, that, that balanced parenting notion. Mom Power was developed in Michigan in collaboration with community partners and it was developed as a, um, as a research model so that from the get-go we have research data surrounding the intervention to tell us if it's working um, and for whom. And so what you're seeing here is the protocol um, and that includes a pre, um, kind of pre-assessment. We also call it an individual session because it's not just data collection, it's really getting to meet the mother for the first time in a smaller environment, so maybe one-on-one, -on -one, two-on-one, um, getting to hear her story, collecting some um, pre-assessment measures. We do multi-methods, so we have her fill out questionnaires on herself and her child. We videotape op observations of her playing with her child and doing various tasks. Um, and then we also do some structured interviews with her that, so that we can look at things such as reflective capacity, which is her ability to understand that her ch developing child has their own um, kind of mind and intention and thoughts and feelings and is she curious about that and can she identify that and be sensitive to that. So that's the pre-session. It's 10 weeks of group. Halfway through we do a, another individual session check-in just to check in to see how the group is going for the mother, 
to ask if she's reaching her goals and if not, how we can support her. A lot of time, this is when we're making really targeted referrals for the mothers, depending on what they need and connecting them to additional services. And then we have a post session where we, we do the pre-assessment battery again to see what's changed and to check in and see how it went to get some, some feedback from the mothers of what they liked, what they didn't like, and how we can continue to improve the group. There's five core components of the mom power intervention. We provide, hmm, no. we provide psychoeducation about attachment-based parenting. So this is an infant mental health intervention. Um, if you're unfamiliar with infant mental health, it's a interdisciplinary framework um, surrounding expertise in child development with understanding um, kind of pregnancy and postpartum and what's going on there, understanding child development, understanding the impact of trauma on child development and on parenting, um, and understanding kind of the policies and systems surrounding that. Um, infant mental health is heavily focused on attachment and relationships because children exist within relationships. You can't have a baby without a baby and someone else. Babies don't develop without a relationship surrounding them. And the healthier and stronger that relationship is, the healthier and stronger that child's development will be. So we do a lot of psychoeducation with these caregivers about the role of the attachment relationship and how to build a healthy attachment relationship with their child. We teach those self-care skills to address mom's own symptoms um, and lower parenting stress. Again, we can't expect mom to calm baby if mom doesn't know how to calm herself. So we do a lot of in-class practice around that. We have um, guided parent-child interactions, so we don't just talk about what to do. We practice what we're saying, and I'll tell you in a moment how we do that. We connect these moms to services, so it's a um, huge part of the intervention to be able to refer these mothers to the other services in the community that might be relevant, and then we're trying to enhance those social supports through having a group, through inviting a guest, um, and through connecting these moms to other groups if relevant. Here's what a group looks like. The moms arrive, the moms and kids arrive, and we share a meal together. Um, and then we have separation. So from the very get-go, we want to start to um, model for these moms that separation for young kids is a hard time. It's a, it's a disruption in the attachment relationship to separate a child from a caregiver. Those of you familiar with the strange um, situation paradigm that measures attachment relationships, the way we stress children out is to separate them from their primary caregiver. So from the very first day, we're drawing caregivers' attention to the fact that when we separate a little one from a caregiver, it can be stressful. And so we acknowledge that by creating a routine around it, and we sing a goodbye song um, to help the children transition from being with mom to being in the child group without mom. Then we have class, 90 minutes of mom group and the child group. And then we have reunion, again, recognizing it's been 90 minutes. It's a hard, long time for little ones to be away. What do you think your child might need? How can you meet that need? Um, and we all come back together. Then we have circle time where we um, all engage in songs and developmentally appropriate games to um, again give, this mom, give the moms an experiential learning opportunity of what it's like to play with their child. A lot of these mothers didn't have folks playing with them when they were young um, and don't really know how to play. Um, and so circle time is a way to create a safe and welcoming environment where the moms get to experience that um, and the children get some positive attention from mom for that time. And then we say goodbye. And because we're recognizing that it's another separation, the families are going home. And for some families, mom power is the safest and most stable place they have to be all week. We want to recognize that separations are hard and, again, start to create that routine around separation so that the moms are starting to think, oh, these are the things that are hard for my child, and this is how I support my child around hard times. So we sing another goodbye song. The curriculum, again, is very attachment-based. It gives moms concrete models to understand child's behavior, and I'll show you a tool we use for that in a moment. We use real life examples, so that we don't really, we have anecdotes in the treatment manual that we can use if we need to, but we rarely need to because these moms are all coming in with stories. They want to tell stories about struggles they're having with their child, and then we just use those stories to apply the principles that we're learning so that they're empowered to think about the problems that they're bringing in with the tools that they're learning in class. We use guided self-care, so we aren't just teaching it and telling them to do it. We're doing it with them in the classes. Um, and then each week, they have a various homework assignment. We call it experiments, where we ask them to experiment with something um, that applies what they're learning. So that might be sunshine time, where we ask them to do something um, fun with their child and, and just try to kind of observe and, and delight in that play interaction with their child. We ask them to practice the self-care skills, et cetera. 
<clears throat> the tree. So this is really the framework that we use throughout the mom power intervention to highlight how we can meet children's basic attachment needs. And those basic needs are a need for connection um, and a need for exploration. And so the tree illustrates kind of how caregivers can do that through being either a safe haven when a child needs connection or being a secure base when a child needs to explore. Those of you familiar with the circle of security intervention, which is another attachment-based intervention, will know this illustration as um, when a parent's being a secure base, the parent's hands are out and the child's kind of running away from the parent, going out to explore. And then when the parent's being the safe haven, the parent's hands are out and the child is running back into the parent's arms. Different way of illustrating it, um, same idea. So with the tree, we all have these basic needs, but I'll talk about it in the context of childhood. Um, so the need for connection. This is any time a child is feeling a strong negative emotion, um, they have a need for connection. They need to put their roots down. And the stronger their roots grow, then the stronger their tree can grow and the more they can branch out and explore. Um, but when they need connection, so maybe a child is feeling scared, maybe they're feeling sad, maybe they're feeling angry, how can we meet that need? And that's what the words in orange are. So we can nurture them. We can provide some kind of comfort and nurturance. We can help to restore emotional balance. So little kids learn how to regulate their emotions through being regulated by their caregivers. Um, you can't ask a, a two-year-old to completely learn how to calm down. They have to have somebody kind of bigger and wiser calm it, helping to calm them down. And then over time, as children develop, if they get that, they learn how to do it themselves. But we have to learn to regulate through being regulated by the caregivers in our environment. And then we can repair. So this means that sometimes there's a disruption in a relationship. So I mentioned that separation is a disruption. It's a caregiver whose sole job is to say, I can keep you safe. I'm consistently here, and I can keep you safe and consistently meet your needs. Um, and when I leave you, that's a disruption. Um, it's important to have disruptions. They're actually really healthy for children because children learn that they can be repaired. But it's really important to repair the disruption. So saying, acknowledging, I know this is hard for you. Mommy loves you. Mommy will be back. Um, and then when mommy comes back, I'm sorry I had to leave you. I missed you. How were you? What did you do? Um, so acknowledging the disruption and working to repair that disruption. So that's the, the roots, building the roots. Um, and then there's the secure base. This is the fact that all children need to explore. Um, this is how they learn about the world. This is how they learn how the world works. This is how they learn how they work in the world and develop their sense of self. It's through exploration. You think about a little infant with sensory motor needs. You've got a little baby kind of exploring toys with their hands and with their mouth. Once they become more mobile, they're exploring through crawling, through walking. I think parents who have a child that goes from crawling to walking probably feel that anxiety of like, oh, they're exploring way too much. They can get into everything now. But that's really how children learn. It's how they learn and how they grow. And so children really need caregivers to be a secure base, which means that caregivers are there. They're present. Um, they're enjoying watching their child explore. They're helping them. Maybe helping means setting limits, um, putting up barriers on the stairs so that kids can't fall down the stairs. Um, teaching children where they can and can't go, helping them, and attending to them, paying attention. I'm watching you explore. I'm not just taking you to the playground and letting you run while I'm on my phone not watching you at all. Children need to be attended to. Um, and so that's how a caregiver can be a secure base. And so with the moms, we talk about how when children are feeling strong negative emotions or have a connection need, they can't branch out and explore. Um, it's not possible. Um, and when we're exploring, we're learning. So children can't learn in the context of strong negative emotions. None of us really can. Um, one illustration I use with caregivers to illustrate this um, is called the Upstairs and Downstairs Brain from Dan Siegel's Whole Brain Child book. Um, and what this is is just an illustration to kind of show us a brain. And talk, I talk about the downstairs brain, which is really kind of the more reptilian, primitive parts of our brain, the limbic system, the amygdala is in there. Um, and then the upstairs brain, the prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain that's developing into our mid-20s and helps us to think and plan and control our emotions and inhibit our impulses. Um, and so with caregivers, I explain that when we feel strong negative emotions, we flip our lid. Our upstairs brain goes offline, and that downstairs brain, that amygdala, is really yelling at us. It's saying, this is a big emotion. And this part of our brain that helps us think logically um, and calm ourselves and think about the future and kind of hold the big context in mind 
goes offline. And for little kids, this part is barely here to begin with. Um, and so we talk about how when the downstairs brain is yelling at us, we can't talk to the upstairs brain. We can't use logic in the context to big, strong, negative emotions. First, we have to soothe the downstairs brain before the upstairs brain will come back online. Um, and so that's why we talk a lot about how when children need to connect and they're feeling a strong negative emotion, we need to nurture them and help restore their emotional balance before we try to appeal to their exploration part, that kind of thinking, logic, learning. Um, it's not a teaching moment if a child is in the middle of a tantrum. First, we gotta soothe, and then once a child is calm, we're able to engage those higher parts of their brain. So really thinking about that. And then we have a few tools in Mom Power that we use to make this even more concrete for the caregivers. First, we chose a tree, or I should say they chose a tree, because I joined this after the tree was chosen, really with intention. So trees are flexible, um, they're resilient, they grow strong, they can survive in harsh climates and weather storms, they can be transplanted. But if you think about a tree when it's going through a hard time, when there's a drought, um, it's too cold, um, you move a tree. If you transplant a tree, it drops its leaves. Um, and it really needs to focus on the roots. So we talk a lot about how children, like trees, during hard times, need to focus on the roots. And the more you focus on the roots, then eventually the, the trunk and the branches and the leaves can grow back. So thinking about that. This is the wondering and response wheel. And this is one of the tools that we use to take the abstract metaphor of attachment in the tree and break it down into, okay, what does this actually mean? What do I do? And so we're going to start on the top right with the green behavior box. Behavior is sometimes an easy port of entry with caregivers because um, it's the least emotionally laden of all of these boxes. What is my child doing? What behavior do I see them doing? Um, and then once we kind of observe the behavior, what are they feeling? So we start to guide caregivers to understand children's behavior as their way of communicating their feelings and their needs. So children don't have the language, young children don't have the language yet to tell us what they're feeling or what they need. So they tell us with their behavior. And as caregivers, it's our job to be curious about what that behavior is trying to communicate. Um, and so we have, what is the behavior? What do I see? Then I'm going to take a guess. What do I think they might be feeling? And then I'm going to connect that to an, a need, those attachment-based needs. What might they need? Is this a branching out moment? Do they need to explore? Or is this a building roots moment? Do they need to connect? And then how can I meet that need as a caregiver? We spend a lot of time using the wheel when a caregiver asks us, what do I do when my child blank? Um, as a mom power leader, I never answer that. Um, I, wanna, I wanna teach a mom to fish, I don't wanna give her the fish. Um, and so we use the wheel. I say, well, let's take it to the wondering and response wheel um, and go around. And if a caregiver is struggling, then we bring the group in. Group, what do you think? What do you think the child might be feeling? What do you think they might need? What are some ways we might be able to meet that need? Um, so that it, it doesn't become a, I'm giving you advice on how to parent, it becomes a, you're applying these tools and feeling more and more empowered that you have the tools you need to understand your child's behavior, feelings, and needs. So here's an example of how this might look when we combine the tree and the wondering response wheel. You imagine a, a toddler throwing a tantrum in a grocery store. What are they doing? Yelling, kicking, screaming, so that's the observable be behavior. Is this a branching out or building roots moment? I think it's a building roots moment because I remember that Diana said if it's a strong negative emotion, it's building roots. What do you think they might be feeling? Perhaps angry, tired, frustrated. They're in the grocery store, maybe they're hungry, that hangry combination, who knows? What might they need? Well, if it's building roots, I know they need connection. Um, and what does that mean in terms of how I can meet that need? How can I connect with my child in that moment? I can be warm, I can offer comfort, I can offer reassurance, I can help calm them, restore their emotional balance, repair the disruption. If there was a disruption in the relationship, maybe I just snapped at them and they're feeling hurt. So I might, I might come down and say, I'm sorry, mommy snapped at you. Um, I might just say, you're really hungry right now. What can we get you? I might say, you're really tired right now. I see you and there's nothing we're going to do about this besides get you home and get you to bed. Um, so it's not necessarily about being able to end the negative emotion. It's about being able to meet the need um, and being willing to go around and around the wondering and response wheel until we get it right. This is just one illustration of how we teach balanced parenting. Um, and with on one side being in charge and strong and on one side being warm and kind. 
Those of you familiar with the, the parenting styles will know this is authoritative parenting. Um, and we talk with caregivers about where they are on this continuum. For women with trauma histories, we usually see that they're on one side or the other. We've got mom who had somebody who was too in charge and strong with her, maybe too mean and too abusive, so she views limit setting and rules as abuse. So then she's over here. She's really good at the warm and kind and the nurturing. She's really not so good at the limit setting and at the kind of being strong and in charge and saying, I can keep you safe part. So we've got that mom. Then we might have the mom who um, was abused and taken advantage of, and so she's developed the belief that the world is unsafe, and in order to stay safe, I have to be really strong and in charge. And in order to keep my kids safe, I have to be really strong and in charge. So that mom might be really good at the limit setting and the rules and the discipline, but not so good at the emotional nurturance stuff. So we ask moms to reflect on where they're at, and then we ask them to experiment with moving more toward the middle while being sensitive about their trauma histories and their cultural context of what their value systems are. Addressing the role of trauma in parenting. So I say it's a trauma-informed curriculum in that as a group leader, I'm trained in the impact of trauma on parenting and I'm creating a safe environment for these mothers. Um, at the same time, we want to acknowledge trauma for these mothers without treating this as a trauma therapy group. It's not. And when you have a group setting with a lot of women with trauma histories, talking about trauma can be very triggering. And so we want to be sensitive about that. And so how we do, how we address this is through a metaphor of scary background music. Those of you familiar with Circle of Security will know it as shark music, but that is copyrighted. So we have scary background music that we do. And I'm going to show you a video of how we teach this to the moms. Sure, the sound is on. Pause it there for time. After we show, so one, we show the videos twice, and we do that with intention, knowing that um, they might have a strong negative reaction, and that's a connection need. If mom's having a strong negative reaction, and we can't expect mom to be curious and to learn and grow unless her connection needs are met. So we show the video once, welcome all responses. Moms might say they loved that. Usually we say, how did that make you feel? And most moms will say, calm, relaxed. Some moms will say, I hated it. It reminded me of this place somebody used to take me, and it made me really anxious. And we welcome it. We welcome all the responses. Um, and then we show it again, because we want to meet those connection needs first before we're asking moms to explore and branch out and think about things in a different way. But in general, that video, when we ask, how did it make you feel? Moms say, calm, relaxed. And, and then we show this one. I think you guys probably can guess of what's coming. Oh, the videos aren't playing. Thank you for telling me. Um, I'll tell you what I'm seeing. <laughs> Are you going to help? OK. Oh, it's beautiful. I'm sorry you couldn't see that. Yeah. It's like a nature scene. describe it. It's okay. I Thank you for your time. You hear the music. Imagine a camera walking through the woods, looking at like trees and a lake, panning kind of like Blair Witch style, first person camera. Um, and with the other one, it was the exact same video. Oh, you can see there a little bit. So there's, there's the video. So we show it once, nature scene, walking through the woods, gentle music, gauge reactions. Nature scene, walking through the woods, scary music, gauge reactions. And usually what happens at this point is the moms acknowledge that the second one felt much more anxiety provoking. Sometimes they say it feels like someone was going to jump out. They felt tense. Um, and so we talk about how by changing the music, we changed kind of their perception 
of the video as well as their emotional reaction to the video. And then we draw this parallel with life experiences and talk about how life experiences are the background music that plays um, for us in our lives as we live our lives. And in the context of parenting, what does that mean? So we ask moms to think about their music, their scary background music. What are the experiences from their past that sometimes come up as scary background music when they're trying to parent? Um, and what does that look like? How do they know? Kind of reflecting on those events. We ask them if they want to, they can share something that added to their scary background music, but we kind of, again, caution if there's really big scary background music to kind of maybe save that for an individual session and not share it with the group, but share some medium scary stuff with the group. Um, and so again, that's kind of creating an environment where we're welcoming and we're saying this matters and we care about this, but also containing and saying we're strong and in charge and we know if everybody's talking about their big trauma, it's gonna probably lead to too much triggering and too many big emotions that we can't address as a group. So creating that safe space for the moms. Then we ask moms to think about what music they're creating for their child. What are the experiences that their child is having um, that might be building their music? And is that music kind of the pleasant music or is it the scary music and reflecting on that? And then we talk about how do we turn down the music? So it's not, we can't change the past and we recognize that. And at the same time, we don't wanna feel helpless to be stuck in reliving the past. And so we talk about what are some ways that you can turn down your scary background music so that it's not interfering as much when you're trying to parent your child. And that's where the self-care skills come in, restoring our own emotional balance. And so here's a list of some of the strategies that we use, again, pulling from dialectical behavior therapy, cognitive behavior therapy, um, mindfulness, et cetera, to try to teach moms, how do I slow down my own emotions and my own scary background music so that I can engage in sensitive caregiving for my child? calming myself before I calm my child. <clears throat> so that's mom power in a nutshell. And now I'll talk to you a little bit about the research around mom power. So there's a randomized control trial that just got published out of the University of Michigan data. Um, this included moms. We really reached out and targeted moms who had a variety of risk factors, um, wanting to kind of get the types of moms that mom power was developed for. Um, and so we have Predominantly um, minority moms, so kind of non-Caucasian minority moms. Young moms, um, you see the majority of the moms had some kind of mental health diagnosis and or the majority had interpersonal trauma exposure. Um, and the majority of these moms were not receiving services. So 27 only 27% were receiving mental health services even though a third and almost a half, a third had PTSD and almost a half had depression. There were no differences between the active treatment group and the control group at baseline on any of these measures. Um, so the, the randomization was effective in that it really equalized kind of rates of trauma, rates of mental illness in the control group versus the intervention group. The control group was that the moms um, engaged in the assessments, the, the pre and post assessments, and then each week they received the mom power curriculum in the mail. So the moms in the group get a curriculum that they can follow along with that has the psychoeducational piece, handouts, activities, et cetera. Um, and the control group received that. And then we sent a postcard saying, please mail this postcard back, indicating that you read the material. So that was our control group. And then the active group was randomized into the 10-week mom power group that I just described. I'm going to summarize the results from that randomized control trial and not get into all of it. But we found that for women with interpersonal trauma history, so those moms that had at least one kind of childhood maltreatment experience or were currently in an intimate um, violence situation, uh, that they showed significant reductions in their PTSD symptoms and depression symptoms compared to the control group from pre to post. We found that these moms in the active treatment condition reported fewer bonding problems, or in other words, gr greater bonding, better bonding with their baby, young child, pre to post compared to control with the um, videotaped parent-child interactions where we had moms playing with kids, doing a teaching task, um, and then doing um, a stressor task. We videotaped those, coded them reliably for various things, and found that the intervention group showed um, increases in emotional sensitivity, mom's ability to kind of sensitively um, be aware of and respond to her child's emotions um, as observed by reliable objective coders compared to the control group. Um, 
reflective functioning, this I mentioned at the very beginning, this is mom's capacity to reflect, I have my own mind, I have my own thoughts, I have my own feelings, I have my own intentions, and my developing child has their own minds, their own thoughts, their own intentions, and those are not the same. Um, a mom with poor reflective functioning um, is probably more likely to project her own thoughts and feelings onto her child. So an example of this is um, I've got a six-month-old who's really wiggling when I'm trying to change his diaper um, and maybe even grabs up at me and, and scratches me. And, and if I've got poor reflective functioning and a trauma history and some negative kind of cognitions around violence, I might think, this baby is trying to hurt me. This baby is trying to make me mad. So because I feel hurt and because I feel mad, I project that intention on the baby. Um, that would be a mom with low reflective capacity. A mom with high reflective capacity might think, oh, this baby really doesn't like getting his diaper changed. I bet he, he's, he might be cold, he might be bored, so maybe I'll try to sing to him or maybe I'll try to make this fun. And I know he's not trying to scratch me, he's a baby, he doesn't have those types of intentions yet. Um, and so that would be a little bit higher reflective capacity. So we saw changes in this for the moms in the intervention group but not moms in the control group. We put a subset of moms in an fMRI scanner pre and post intervention in both the intervention group and the control group um, and had them do a variety of tasks related to parenting. So looking at pictures of their baby, showing different emotions, listening to baby cry, their babies cry, um, and found that empathy circuits um, and circuits related to um, kind of emotion regulation and, and that ability to kind of understand my emotion and calm my emotion um, changed in the intervention group but not in the control group. And all of these findings are really in the context of the women who had greater risk. So either the women who had interpersonal trauma histories or the women who had depression or PTSD or both. And usually they were all kind of combined. You have one, you have a lot of those risk factors. So we're seeing the most pronounced effects of mom power for the women with greater risk at baseline. This is a quote from a mom power graduate. I didn't have any roots growing up in foster care and now I see how important they are and that I want connection moments and to build roots with my baby. So um, just highlighting clinically, this, this intervention is, has really changed so many lives. The research supports that, but I never want to get away from the stories of the lives of the families who have, who have been um, brave enough and open enough to being in the mom power groups. Regarding next steps, where are we going from here? In Michigan, they're working on a father adaptation called Fraternity of Fathers. They piloted it with dads, and dads didn't like dad power. Um, so they're de developing this in Flint, Michigan, with dads there, and already finding that it's got to be a lot more uh, active with the dads. I don't think that really surprises anyone. So they're doing a lot more team building exercises to teach these, these concepts. <clears throat> they have an adaptation for military families in Michigan called Strong Families that works with family pre and post deployment. And they're, they're actively rolling out mom power, um, an adaptation called Healthy, Healthy Hearts and Minds on Babies um, that's teaching early Head Start teachers and the parents involved in early Head Start these ideas. So that's all Michigan stuff. I've been in Johnson City for a year. I've been at ETSU for a year. I'm going into my second year. Um, and so I, my hope and my dream and what's actively happening is that it's, it's growing here, sharing, sharing mom power with Northeast Tennessee and maybe even beyond. Um, and so have been actively working to build co community partnerships. Um, next week I'll host a three-day training in collaboration with the University of Michigan. We're sold out. We've got 30 community-based providers coming to that training to get trained in the mom power model. As I mentioned at the very beginning, mom power is meant to be run by community-based providers in community agencies where families are going. Um, and so it's not meant to be housed at the university. It's meant to be in the community run by community providers. So we're working on that. Um, and then recognizing that the opioid addiction and neonatal abstinence syndrome are a huge problem in this region. And that's something that's different here compared to when mom power was developed in Michigan. So holding in mind that that's a big need, um, these moms and these babies, um, reaching them and, and thinking about and working with community partners to wonder how we can um, whether and how we can use mom power to meet that need and, and reach these moms and start to kind of change the trajectory for these children as well. We're starting our first mom power group in October. So the first mom power group is happening in Kingsport um, at Harvest Community Church. It's, it's hosted in a church because they've offered us free space and they're right downtown near a bus line and they've got child friendly facilities. So we're really excited they partnered with us. Families free is a local agency. It's a faith-based mental health agency that serves women impacted by domestic violence and substance abuse. They're my community partners who are going to help 
co-facilitate the group with me. Um, and so that's starting in October. We had 10 seats and we've got 11 moms. So we're already at capacity. We're beyond capacity for our first group, which is just really exciting that um, it's, the seeds are being planted in this region in terms of growing capacity to offer this group to families um, and growing provider capacity so that other community agencies such as Frontier Mental Health, et cetera, will also be involved in providing this in the future. I'm going to skip over that. I want to thank everybody back in Michigan who developed this and who's working on it. I want to thank all my um, kind of Tri-Cities community partners that have been working with me to, to grow this, including my, my undergrad research assistants, who, some of whom are here and will help and have helped with this, um, and all the families who participated. With that, I'll say thank you and open up the floor to questions. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was the timing of the group that you're going to be doing in Tennessee is noon to three. Mm -hmm. So presumably these are not working moms to be able to do that. The other thing that I <clears throat> wanted to ask you about is, you know, you have about 10 people here. Um, so I don't know with this particular model, if the Michigan group or anywhere, you know, a lot of what comes down now is looking at what's the dollar gain you get mm -hmm. for an intervention versus not. Mm -hmm. Has anything of that nature been estimated in terms of future, future prediction of how much by, you know, helping the mom now, mm -hmm. not getting into the abusive cycle, how much savings of potentially mental health needs for the future of kids and not, them not getting into the same pattern. Is anything like that been done? No, but it's a, it's a great thing to be holding in mind. And I know the Michigan folks are now partnering with the business school to be able to ask some of those questions and think about that. And as I'm building capacity here um, and the research around the mom power intervention as it grows, the financial aspect is something that I'm holding in mind. And I welcome um, feedback. My email address is up here. So if there's folks in this region at the university or beyond that you know that have expertise in that, um, I welcome that collaboration. Because I think it's so important to be able to show. I think we all believe it, that it's saving us money. But prevention is a hard sell sometimes. And so the more we can put dollars to that, I think the more powerful this will be over time. So I appreciate that suggestion. Oh, and to go back to your first question of, Yes, we are, we are predominantly um, serving moms right now who maybe are not working, unemployed, or have um, jobs that allow them the flexibility to come at that time. In the future, we hope to offer groups at different times and in different places. Um, but for this first group, that was just the logistics in terms of being at the church, um, everybody's staff time, and then in terms of having that child team piece, being able to get the child team there for this first group, it was just all logistics that it worked out that way. But we hope in the future to have some evening classes as well as daytime classes to be able to have a broader reach. Related to your points at the end, I was just wondering if there's any evidence about the mom intervention's effect on uh, substance use, and particularly prescribed substance use uh, in the mothers and uh, HIV risk behavior? <clears throat> no data on it yet. Um, my, with this growing research project here, substance use is absolutely something that I'm holding in mind and will assess for and monitor. Um, to be honest, HIV risk behaviors haven't been on my radar, but you've planted that seed, so now I'll be thinking about whether and how to incorporate that into the assessment battery. I'm listening to an interesting, uh, one of the great teaching courses called How We Learn. And she makes a very interesting point. Um, I noticed that you said, well, you know, if the willful and whining child tends to do that a lot, it's probably a question of going to roots. But there, oftentimes, are the particularly willful and whining child, especially infants or toddlers, that seemingly have very solid roots. Her point in the course was that when that's the case, you have to take your time and carefully understand what the child's motives are. Very hard to do in a pre-verbal child. Mm -hmm. So 
I'm thinking that as your groups expand, you're going to have both ends of that program. I'm, I'm wondering what you do with those particular children that are especially willful, but seemingly do have a good root structure. Great question. Um, <clears throat> what do you do with the willful children that already have strong roots? I think, well, I want to say I, I don't think I have the absolute answer, but I'll just talk through my thoughts around it, um, is that the model itself is not an all or nothing. You're doing one or you're doing the other. You're, you're, you can only build roots or, or branch out. It's more about being curious. And I think that curiosity behind what is this behavior communicating would be the bridge of, is this, communi is this communicating that this child needs me to be strong and in charge and to set limits? Um, are they exploring of what, what they can get away with? And, you know, is kind of the, you think of a, a child who you can obviously tell it might be fake crying. They fall down, they're fine, then they look up at you, and they see, you make eye contact, and then they start to cry, right? That, like, whimper, like, oh, and, and you know, like, they're okay. And so that, even though it might look like it's a building roots moment, is actually a branching out moment because they're exploring what can I, what can I get away with? What can I get out of this situation? And so then they would need that strong and in charge and that I'm going to help you by setting a limit and saying, I'm here for you, and I'm still not going to kind of buy into this thing that I know that you're doing. So being curious about the why behind the behavior and then kind of trying to be an experimenter in, in how you respond to that need. Anybody else? Okay. Well, I thank you for your time and attention. Please reach out if you um, have ideas of how to continue to help me grow Mom Power. I, like I said, I'm new here and I'm still learning and growing myself, so I welcome feedback. <clears throat> Hi. Oh, I should turn.